Well, good morning. Welcome again to the Bethany of Social Reform Presbyterian Church as we gather together to worship the Lord our God on this blessed Sabbath day. Well, as we begin this morning, just a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, just as a reminder, we'll be meeting again at 5.30 tonight uh, for our Sunday evening service, and we've started a new series on Sunday night, uh, basically titled How God Works, as we kind of go through uh, question four of the Shorter Catechism and, and talk about what it means that God's eternal and that God is holy and, and the like. So we invite everybody back out at 5.30 uh, for that time. Also, uh, this week, uh, Wednesday night, at 6.30 p.m., we'll be having our annual Thanksgiving service. So we invite everybody out for that as we spend time giving thanks to the Lord for uh, the work that He has done for us in this past year. And again, we, uh, that'll be 6.30 on Wednesday. Also, on the uh, lecterns all around you, uh, there is the 2023 budget. Uh, so be sure to pick up your copy of that. We'll have a congregational meeting on the 11th of December. Uh, to approve that as well as re-elect our treasurer and uh, approve the Sabbath school uh, budget. And as part of that, we're going to have a presentation uh, from Missions and Outreach on uh, some opportunities we have uh, to kind of improve uh, our uh, outside facilities here at Bethany. So again, just kind of make sure that's on your calendar for the 11th of December. Also, on the 11th of December, we'll be having uh, the uh, children's Christmas pageant. Uh, that'll be uh, that night at 5 o'clock. So, again, we invite everybody out uh, for that. And, again, just as a reminder to the kids, again, we'll be having pageant practice on the 4th or the 3rd. Is that? That's Saturday, yeah. So, the 3rd, uh, we'll have pageant practice. It'll be at 3 o'clock. So, again, if you want to be part of that, please uh, be there for that uh, time uh, as we get ready for that. Uh, and one other thing that I have written down here, uh, in your in your bulletin, uh, there is a listing of dates uh, for November and December. Uh, so please uh, uh, you know, tack that on your refrigerator somewhere so that you are reminded about that. Also, one other thing, if I can read my handwriting, the uh, Catawba women's due, dues are due. Uh, so please make sure to put that in uh, one of the four plates uh, around the sanctuary. So as uh, we prepare to worship the Lord today, uh, let, oh, there's one other thing, uh, and Michaela told me to put an arrow or I would forget, uh, the annual fall offering for ARP um, you know, missions and for the work of the denomination is in your bulletin, so if, if you feel moved by the Spirit to give to that, uh, please place that in the uh, plate as well. Uh, so let's go ahead and prepare ourselves for a moment of silent prayer as we come to worship the Lord. Amen. As we come to worship God, of course, we start with a call to worship. Uh, this time in our service is a reminder that we are here because God has called us to be here. Uh, to give thanks for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and be reminded of His second coming. And so the words to which uh, the Lord has drawn our attention to today comes to us from the book of James, chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Amen. As we are called to worship by the word of our God, as we are reminded to be patient and to be ready, 
We return our thanksgiving unto God uh, by using the words of hymn 659 from the Red Trinity Hymnal. And as we stand and as we sing this hymn, let us do so with joy and grace in our hearts as we lift up our voice united to the heavens in the name of our God. Let us stand and let us sing together. together to exalt the name of the Lord our God as we raise up again our hearts to the heavens and as we receive the blessings of the good news of Jesus Christ. Let us come now before our glorious God in prayer. Let us pray. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of heaven and of earth, the God who is our strength and our shield, and the God who is our ever-present help. Unto you we have come to worship this morning. Unto you we have come to raise up again our voices to the heavens. That we might be reminded what it means to be servants of the Most High. That we might be reminded what it means that we have had our sins paid for by the blood of the Lamb. And what it means to be those who have no reason to fear this present evil world. For while nations rage, and while Satan has his day, we know that these things are not only temporary, but they are being destroyed this very morning by the gathering together of the bro uh, of brothers and sisters in Christ. We are showing the world that we rest and trust and have our hope not in those things which are passing away, but in the eternal promise we have received from before the foundation of the world. That our God is God above all. And that his son is the prince of peace. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the king of kings. And that every nation ever heaven will bow the knee. And confess in the day to come. That Jesus Christ is Lord. And in light of these things that we gather together. Uh, saying the words that your son taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Again, as we say these words and as we are reminded again of the blessings which have come through the bread of life, 
We turn uh, to our uh, Old Testament reading today, which comes from 1 Kings chapter 6, as we continue to see the life and work of the King Solomon. And so let us turn here as we continue to read the book of 1 Kings chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Zin, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. Now the house which King Solomon built for the Lord, its length was 60 cubits, its width 20, and its height 30 cubits. The vestibule in front of the sanctuary of the house was 20 cubits long across the width of the house. And the width of the vestibule extended 10 cubits from the front of the house. And he made for the house windows with beveled frames. Against the wall of the temple he built chambers all around. Against the walls of the temple all around the sanctuary and the inner sanctuary. Thus he made side chambers all around it. The lowest chamber was five cubits wide, the middle was six cubits wide, and the third was seven cubits wide. For he made narrow ledges around the outside of the temple, so that the support beams would not be fastened into the walls of the temple. And the temple, when it was being built, was built with stone, finished at the quarry, so that no hammer or chisel or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built." The doorway for the middle story was on the right side of the temple. They went up by stairs to the middle story and from the middle to the third. So he built the temple and finished it. And he paneled the temple with beams and boards of cedar. And he built side chambers against the entire temple, each five cubits high. They were attached to the temple with cedar beams. Amen. Thanks be to God for the reading of his holy and his perfect word. Please be seated. I invite the children to come up today for the lesson. Well, good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing today? Good. I know that uh, you know some of y'all are getting over the colds and flus, and I know a bunch of your uh, friends and, and brothers and sisters in Christ are also dealing with the flu right now. It seems to be just everywhere. And you know, as we think about that, as we also think about what I just read, you know, it can seem sometimes that the days that the Lord has given us uh, are becoming longer and longer. It can seem as if some of the things that we deal with from day to day are uh, outside of God's uh, eyes. But what do we know about God? What does he see? That's right, he sees everything, right? There's, there's nothing under heaven that God does not know about, that God does not see. But we also know something, that there's nothing in the whole world that God has not Established that he hasn't, from before the world even was, he has not put into place. And sometimes we don't think of our sicknesses being part of God's plan. Now, when you were sick, uh, were you thanking God for being sick? No, right? Yeah. You know, what, what were you more likely doing uh, while you were sick? Right? You're probably complaining to God right, about being sick, you know, wondering why you weren't able to go out and play, uh, why you weren't at school. Now, you may not have been uh, worried about that part of it, right? but you, you, you were wondering, why is this happening? And right, we always ask that question, right? Why are these things happening? Well, there's something in the story I just read that tells us about that. Now, as we hear these somewhat boring details of how the temple was made, one of the things that said there is that there was no hammers or tools in the temple. Everything had to be made and prepared 
off site and then brought finished to the temple. Now, why do you think God didn't want tools in the temple? Any ideas why God wouldn't want tools in the temple? You know, what, what do tools do when they're working? Like they make noise, right? And what else do they cause? They cause dust, right? And they, they cause people to wait. But you see, when God was putting his temple together, he wanted it to be built perfect, and he wanted it to be ready as soon as it was finished. And so everything was prepared off-site and brought fully made to the temple. And so when we think about you know, us being sick and we think about the things going on in our lives, one of the things we need to remember is something I said in the call to worship. Right? We're called to be patient. Right? We're, being call we're called to make ready, to prepare, and to be patient for the coming of the Lord. And one of the things we believe and rest in and have hope in is that when Jesus comes back, everything is going to be just as it should be. And so we're being made ready. We're being prepared. We are being moved by the Holy Spirit to see that even in our sickness, we know that God is preparing us for a glorious day where we're going to get in that temple made without hands, made without tools, made without the designs of men. But in the plan of God, all things will be ready for us to dwell forever in his house. So when, you, when, you, when you're sick, when you're, when you're wondering what the purpose of life is and, and what's going on, remember that. That God hasn't forgotten you, right? He hasn't abandoned you. But he's making you ready. He's teaching you so that when he comes, you'll be ready for him. Right, Y'all ready to pray? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for the glory of your word and for the way that even in instructions in the building of the temple, we can see your glory. We can see your plan, and we can understand more about what it is you call us uh, to do your work, and to be ready, and to be patient and prepared for the coming of Jesus. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, one of the ways that the Lord prepares us for his coming is through worship. You know, we come together on, on the Lord's Day morning and evening and on Wednesday nights to prepare for Jesus' second coming. And as part of that, we sing together. And the hymns that we sing, the Bible songs we sing, we sing to learn. And we sing to testify. And we sing to be reminded of who our God is. That we might, again, be thankful for all that the Lord does. Let us stand as we sing uh, our next hymn, hymn number 715. From the Red Trinity Hymnal. Let us stand, let us rejoice, and let us give thanks.
as we do pray for the harvest that is to come, as we pray for the harvester to come and to uh, bring us unto himself. Let us now be seated as we come together for a time of prayer, a time as we lift up our knees to the heavens and as we are reminded uh, that God hears the prayers of his people. Let us prepare for prayer. Let us pray. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of grace and of mercy, the God who is our strong tower, who has sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, shall have everlasting life. Dear Father, as we gather together on this day that you have made, as we take rest from our worldly labors, as we set aside uh, the trials and tribulations of this earthly life, to spend uh, this time in worship, in humble reliance on your grace, on your love, and on your promise. For it is by your word that we stand, it is by your word and the time spent in your word that we are renewed and replenished. For to God we testify that we have no hope outside of Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He alone is the one who grants us access to the throne room of heaven. To our glorious heavenly Father. It is through Christ that we have been saved. It is through Christ that our sins have been washed away. It is through Christ that we are held and have the assurance that no created being, not even Satan himself, can ever take us out of the arms of our God. And to God, as we are reminded of these blessed truths, as we hear in your word how you have established your ways, and that you have called us to prepare, to wait, and to make ready for your Son's second coming. We confess, dear God, that we have often acted as a limelight, and gone to the land of the Moabites. We have often been like Judah in the days of Isaiah, pining after the help of Egypt. And dear God, for these things we confess our sins this morning. We pray, dear God, that as you open our eyes and our ears to see our transgressions, as you open our eyes to see where it is we have broken your commandments. Where we have longed after the idols of this age. As we pray these things, dear God, we pray earnestly. That as you send your Holy Spirit to give us assurance of faith. As your Holy Spirit causes our hearts to look not upon the works of the flesh, but upon the finished work of our Redeemer. We pray, dear God, that our eyes would, would focus upon the cross at Calvary. Dear God, that we would know that all of our sins are forgiven. That all of our sins have been taken and nailed to that cross. That Christ has not died to be an example that Christ does not die to show us a better way of love. But that Christ has died on the cross 
so that we might not know the taste of death. That we might not know the realities of the grave and of hell itself. But because he has laid down his life for sinners. Because he has laid down his life for us. We can truly face tomorrow. We can truly have no anxiousness about this present evil world. For we know dear God that you are Through the work of your people. Through the work of your church. Through the work of the gospel itself. Moving through the nations. Convicting men of their sin and their need of Christ. And to God we pray this morning. Especially for the works that are ongoing. The works of our, our missionaries, not only in the ARP, but uh, throughout the, the gospel church. As we read of your great commission that you've given to us, and as we lift up those who are at the tip of the spear. To God, we are reminded that we also are missionaries in this community. That you've called us to, 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 to give a testimony for the hope that's within us. You've not called us to express that in perfect words or in uh, some highfalutin way. But you've called us to bear witness through the life that we live, through the way that we talk, and to the way that we treat one another. Under God, as we do think about the ways that we express our faith from day to day, for God, we do turn once more unto you, for our strength in that work is Jesus Christ. Our strength in that work is the truth of the word of God. For no temple built by the hands of men can stand in the face of Of your almighty soul. For we know its strength. We know its power. And to God we pray this morning. That we will trust in the power of your word. To accomplish your purposes. For you've told us. Uh, through the prophet Isaiah. That your word as it goes forth. Will never return void. But will always accomplish. What you have set forward. For it to accomplish. We pray, dear God, that we would never be ashamed of your word. That we would never be embarrassed by what you have laid out in the scriptures. And we pray, dear God, that you would encourage us to rest and trust in you alone. And as we pray for these things, dear God, we also continue to ask your mercies to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ here at Bethany. We especially think of our, our, our families who are dealing uh, with the flu and with sickness. And we pray for moms and dads that you uh, would uh, be with them. Uh, help, again, the children as they, they deal with these illnesses. Again, may you give them relief and healing. We pray also this morning for our, uh, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ who, who by providence aren't able to be here this morning. God, we lift them up unto you, especially those who are homebound. Pray to God that they might know again that they are not alone. That not only do they have the presence of the Holy Spirit, but they have again the bond of our union with Jesus Christ. We especially pray for those who feel the acuteness of uh, that loneliness in these seasons of the year. Pray to God that you would uh, move us to, to reach out to those who are in need of companionship. In need of that reminder that they are brothers and sisters. Dear God, we do pray for the travels and for all the events of this coming week. Dear God, that your name might be glorified. That we might look back at this year that has passed and give thanks even for the dark times. Even for the difficult days. 
For dear God, you've given us all these things to make us ready for the coming of your Son. And dear God, we do lift up unto you also this morning those unspoken prayers, those things not only to you. You know, we know that your Holy Spirit has gone into the depths of our hearts and has revealed to, us, to, to you our needs. And many times, dear God, you answer our prayers even before we utter them. And we rejoice in this. And as we continue to worship you this morning, as we continue to give, again, attention to your word, we pray, dear God, that you, again, will not only instruct us in the ways of your truth, but that you will take these words and apply them unto our soul. Then when I go from this place and into that evil world, knowing your power and your strength, both this day and forevermore, and in Christ's name we pray, Amen. Well, the words which I would like to draw your attention to come to us from Matthew chapter 5 as we continue our time in the Sermon on the Mount. So I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word as we go to Matthew chapter 5, beginning there at verse 13 through verse 16. Again, hear the word of the Lord, Matthew 5, beginning at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as you have opened these words in your providence on this day, we pray again through your power and your promise that you would apply these truths to our hearts and that you would guide us in all things through your truth. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I know this is probably getting repetitive at this point uh, since uh, we've been going through these Beatitudes, but it's always important that we remember the context of what it is we are reading. Whenever a writer of the Bible, whether it be a prophet in the Old Testament or an apostle in the New Testament or even Jesus himself quotes a verse or a series of verses from the Old Testament, what the Holy Spirit intends for us to do is to go back, not just read that one little verse, but to read the context and probably more than just the context, but the, the whole series of events that are taking place around that one verse that is quoted. Now, again, that sounds like a lot of work. But one of the things the Holy Spirit intends for us to do is to spend time in the Word of God. And that's one of the ways the Holy Spirit accomplishes that. By pointing us back to what has been said before, that we can better understand what has been said in the moment. And one of the things that we talked about in our time in the Sermon on the Mount is that Jesus came not to say anything new. Jesus learned at the feet of his rabbi. And he learned the word of God on Saturdays in the synagogue. And he would go at other times and examine the scroll. We hear that, of course, in the book of Luke, that as Jesus grew, he grew in knowledge and understanding. And he did that, again, not by a kind of going off to a secret place and having the Holy Spirit download things into his head, but through the normal means of grace. And one of the things Jesus does quite regularly in the Gospels is he's, is he's trying to teach the disciples, as well as us, that things are not nearly as complicated as we like to make them to be. 
And so Jesus, as he is teaching the disciples here in the Sermon on the Mount, goes back to some Old Testament pictures to help them understand what he's calling them to do. Right? The whole Sermon on the Mount is about discipleship. It's about what it means to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. Each of the Beatitudes, as we, we, we walked through them, have illustrated for us a character point of Jesus himself, of the Father, of the Holy Spirit, and of those who are made in the image of God. Right? What does it mean, again, that those who mourn should be comforted, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth, all of these blessings that we see right, are a testimony of the fact that, again, the Lord who has done all these things will continue to do these things for his people. And so here we have this morning, in verse 13, the illustration of salt. Now, you know, where, where I grew up in West Virginia, not too far from where I grew up in Charleston, there used to be these huge salt mines. And, and one of the fellas who happened to grow up in those salt mines was a man by the name of Booker T. Washington. You may have heard of him. And another fellow down there was George Washington Carver. And both of those fellas grew up working in those salt mines. And one of the things that both of the men did later on in life, of course, they were involved in, in science, they were involved in education, right? the founding of the Tuskegee Institute and all that stuff. Well, one of the things that uh, Booker T. did quite well is he would always talk about the work of education as the work of salt. Now, that seems kind of strange, right? What, what, what does education have to do with salt? Well, Jesus here is using salt in a similar way because salt is a preserver. Remember back in the old days before refrigeration, before freezers and stuff, how did you keep pork cured over the winter? Well, you would pack it in salt, right? You would have salt cured pork. That way it wouldn't go bad over the winter and you would have something to eat. And Jesus is mainly here thinking of salt in that way as a preserver. And again, Jesus is not saying anything new. In fact, anybody who is listening to him, because remember, he's mainly talking to Jews at this point, would think back to the covenants of salt that were made in the Old Testament. And every time there is a covenant of salt made, it is a testimony to the permanence of the promises of God. It is a promise to the fact that God is going to preserve his covenant people regardless of what happens. Despite the sin of Israel, despite the unbelief even of the priests themselves, what is it that enables Jesus Christ to be born at Bethlehem in the day that God had made? And it was not the fact that Israel remained faithful. It was the fact that God had remained faithful providentially from the days of his promise in Genesis 3.15 all the way to the day in which Christ was born. And the covenant of salt uh, we hear, uh, for instance, in, uh, the, uh, in, in the scriptures there, in uh, Numbers 18 and 19, all the heave offerings of the holy things with the children of Israel offer the Lord, I have given to you and your sons and daughters with you as an ordinance forever. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord with you and your descendants with you. Now again, I've just quoted a verse from, from Numbers 18. And again, as I said, we're not to be biblicists. We're not to just pick and choose verses and, and, and play with them however we like. Right? We go back to Numbers 18 and what's happening in Numbers 18? In Numbers 18, the Lord is establishing the work of the Levites. And one of the things the Levites are supposed to do as they're offering up the sacrifice of the temple is that they are supposed to sprinkle salt in every single offering they make. And we learn about that in Leviticus chapter 2. In Leviticus 2 verse 11 it says, No grain offering which you bring to the Lord should be made with leaven. For you shall burn no leaven or any honey in any offering to the Lord made by fire. As for the offering of the first fruits, you shall offer them to the Lord, but they shall not be burned on the altar for a sweet aroma. And every offering of your grain offering shall be seasoned with salt. 
You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings you shall offer salt. Now think about that for a moment. Again, the, the, the picture of salt is, is, is a vital one to understand again the work of God from generation to generation. Right? The Levites were to sprinkle salt in every offering made to the Lord as a sign, as a testimony that the covenant God had made with them would be forever lasting. That there would never be a time where the Lord would not be their Lord. And think again about what the offerings made in the temple were for. Right? The offerings made in the temple were a picture, were a type, were a, a, a future testimony to what would happen when the Messiah would come. Because no Jew, at least a faithful Jew in the Old Testament, believed that their sins were paid for by the blood of goats and sheep and heifers and birds and the like. But they were not offering up these animals thinking the animals themselves were the answer for their need for the forgiveness of sin. But they understood that this again was a, a, a temporary measure established by God himself to prepare them and remind them of two things. First of all, the consequences of sin. You jump back a chapter there in Leviticus and go to Leviticus 1, and I invite you to go read that this afternoon. And one of the things you're going to see is who was responsible for killing the animal. It wasn't a Levite. It wasn't a scribe. It wasn't somebody you paid to do it. No, if you had sinned before the Lord, you were responsible for bringing that offering to God. And you brought it to the temple. The Levite would inspect it to make sure that it was without blemish. And the Levite would speak over the sacrifice. And when the time came in the sacrifice, it would be your job to take the knife, to grab the animal by the head, and slit its throat and kill it. Now think again about that for a moment. What were you supposed to learn from that moment, from that time as you took life from that animal? And that is the consequence of sin. And what had Adam's sin brought upon the world? And before Adam's sin, there was no death. Before Adam's sin, there was no illness. Before Adam's sin, there was no hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, Anything that we consider to be bad did not exist before Adam's sin. All of that has come because Adam ate of the fruit in the garden. And so when the devil is trying to confuse Eve, and Eve is allowing herself to be confused, what does the devil say? You shall not surely die. And what he, the devil's trying to tell her, like, look, if you do this, you're not going to, like, keel over. Right? You're not going to fall over dead. And he was right about that, right? And, of course, that's often how Satan works. Like, Satan almost never shows up with horns and a tail and fire and wearing red pants. How does the devil show up? Like, Paul warns us in the strongest words, the devil always shows up as an angel of light. Right, the, the greatest danger today to the church is not the unbelieving world. The greatest danger to the church today is the church. Right, the greatest danger we see today is the false teachers and, and false uh, uh, churches which are inoculating people against the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's really what Jesus is speaking of here when he talks about the salt of the earth. Because salt, when it's good, it's great. But what does Jesus say about that salt that ceases to be salt? You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. That's the promise that God gives to the church which abandons the flavoring that God has given to. 
And it goes back again to this whole idea of the covenant of salt, of the seasoning that salt was to give to every offering made to the Lord. Right? Why do we as a people, you know, specifically here at Bethany, but generically as Bible-believing Christians, why do we believe what we believe? We believe what we believe because the gospel alone has power. Right? We believe what we believe because Jesus alone is the answer for sin and salvation. You can think about what Jesus has come to do here in the gospel of Matthew. What he's come to do in all the gospels. Remember in the Gospel of Luke when, when Jesus uh, runs away from his mom and goes back to the temple and, 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 and Mary comes up to him and, and what does she say? What are you doing? I'm sure many of y'all have had that situation in life where your children have run off in the store and you can't find them. And you're running around looking for them and you find them and what do you say to them? You don't go up to them and say, oh, did you find what you needed? Did, 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 you know, have you found what it is that you're looking for? Now, what do we do? Right? We grab them by the scruff of the neck and ask them, what is their problem? Right? What, what are you doing? You were supposed to be with me. I didn't tell you you could go look at the fish. I didn't tell you you could go you know, play with toys. I didn't tell you you could do these things. And why are we concerned? Well, again, we live in a fallen world. And, you know, it, it, it's... You know, there, there's no sense in which uh, Mary is sinning by asking Jesus what he's doing. Just as Jesus, of course, is not committing any sin by being where he's at. And what does he say in response to his mother's concern? He says, I am about my father's business. And that testimony we see there must be the testimony of the church. Right? We have been given a purpose. By the Lord our God. And what is the purpose of the church? The primary purpose of the church is to go out unto the nations and proclaim Christ and Him crucified, to disciple the nations, to baptize the nations, and prepare for the coming of the Lord Jesus a second time. And what that means is, is that the church must have flavor in it. And the church must have something about it that separates it from the world around it. If the, if the world looks to the church and can't tell any difference between itself and the church, well, I think that's exactly what Jesus is talking about here when it says the salt has lost its flavor. It's worth of nothing but being thrown out. You know, and one of the false teachings that's popular in our day is that, you know, that, that Jesus is uh, the, the happy God, right? And the Father is the mad God. And of course, as with everything else, there's nothing new under the sun, right? This has been a common uh, problem in the history of the church. And if you want to, you know, again, uh, impress your friends with, with, with knowledge, right? Go talk to them about Marcy. Right, yeah, I, I'm going to ask everybody next week. Not really, but I'm going to ask everybody next week about Marcion. And what did Marcion teach? Marcion taught that the God of the Old Testament was the God of thunder, the God of lightning, the God of judgment. And he's been overthrown by the loving, gracious, merciful, hippie God, Jesus Christ. But is, is that the Jesus that we learn in the New Testament? Who talks about hell more than any person in the whole Bible? Jesus does. And why does Jesus talk about hell more than anybody else? Because he loves men and women. He has come to warn them of what is to come. And so the church must maintain nothing more, nothing less, than what Jesus has given to us to proclaim. Because as soon as we either make deals with the world around us, well, we won't preach on that so that you'll all leave us alone. How does that work? It never works. Because if you give the world an inch, what are they going to take? You take a mile. And so we must stand fast with what has been revealed to us in the Scriptures. 
And we must be careful that we not be wiser than God. Again, remember, Jesus is not saying anything new. He is revealing what has already been said in the, New, in the Old Testament. Right? He's testifying to what the prophets had said of himself. That's one of the reasons why after using the salt language, he then goes uh, to uh, the light. Right? You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all that are in the house. Again, think about the picture here. Right? If salt is to testify to the permanency of the promise of God, the permanency of the everlasting promise that God has made, and the everlasting work that has been given to the church, that we are to be flavorful, that if somebody bit us, they would taste salt. Right? They wouldn't spit us out of the our mouth because we didn't taste like anything. Yeah, that's one of the... One of the things about, you know, my travels over the past month and a half is that, you know, they don't use seasoning in other countries, and I can't figure out why. Yeah, you'd think, you know, nations which were involved in colonialism would have brought all those good seasonings back with them, but they seem to have gotten lost somewhere in transition. Like, we, we love to put seasoning on our food here for good reason, right? Because it tastes good. And we, we can tell the difference when it's there and when it's not there. And so Jesus, to kind of push this picture further, says, the church, what are you supposed to be? You are supposed to be a light on a hill. Now, many of y'all who grew up in the church remember a song you used to sing at uh, camp. Right? What are we supposed to do with our light? Are we supposed to hide it under a bushel? Oh, no. What are we supposed to do? Let it shine. Well, how do we shine... Right? The light. Well, Jesus tells us we just need to stand on top of the hill and let it shine. The world's going to see it. Now think about how many times that Jesus uses light to describe himself. What has he come to do but to shine into the darkness? Right? What has he come to do but to reflect unto the darkness its own depravity, its own wickedness, its own evil? And how does Jesus go about proclaiming the light? And he doesn't come up with fancy new ways of doing things. He goes from town to town, city to city, place to place, proclaiming his father's business. Which is to proclaim to the world that there is only one way to heaven. There is only one way to be reconciled to the father. And that's through Jesus Christ the righteous. You can't think about the nature again of what has been declared in the gospel. What's been shown to us about the gospel in Leviticus 2 and Numbers 18. Why are we here today? We're not here today to listen to me talk. At least, yeah, I don't think y'all. Why are we here today? We are here because Jesus Christ has died for our sins. We're here today because Jesus Christ has laid down his life for us. And the proper response to the salvation given unto us is worship of our Heavenly Father. And what are we going to be doing in eternity in the heavens? We're going to be worshiping our Heavenly Father. We're going to be at the throne room of God with the elders and with the martyrs and with all those who have gone before. And we're going to be proclaiming the holiness of God. And there's going to be light in heaven. Go back with me to the beginning of the book of Genesis for a second. As we're hearing of the creation of earth, right? We hear about the Spirit hovering over the waters. And then, right, you know, God forms things out of the void. And one of the first things that we're told there in the book of Genesis is that God brings light to the world. And you notice that light comes before the creation of the sun and the moon. Because wherever God goes, light shines. And wherever God's church goes, what do you think we should bring with us? Right, the light of the gospel of peace. 
You'll notice again another word that Jesus uses in our passage this morning. He says in verse 15, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. Let's jump to the other end of the Bible, to the book of Revelation, and the warning given to the churches. You know, one of the things that God says to the churches in the book of Revelation, and remember, we do believe that those seven churches were real, honest-to-goodness churches. They weren't metaphors, uh, but they were real places with real people, with real ministers, with real problems. One of the things that he warns those churches is that if they forsake their first love like Ephesus did, or even worse, if they're like Laodicea and refuse to pick a side, what is Christ, remember, Christ going to do to that church? He's going to spit them out of his mouth and he's going to remove the lampstand. Again, Jesus doesn't say anything without a purpose. And so that lampstand that we see removed in the book of Revelation is a pointing back here to Matthew 5. If we're not going to use our lampstand, Jesus is going to take it away from us. But if we, if we try to manufacture our own light, then all we will produce is darkness. If all we try to do again is to, to, to be one with the world, then we'll be one with their darkness. Because Jesus again testifies to the nature of uh, this light. Because he testifies to us so many times in the Old Testament about, about the way in which the work of God in our hearts is the very light of the Lord. In Psalm 27, 1, it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And listen again what David says there. The Lord is my life and my salvation. And I have nothing to do with that. It's only the work of God engaged in the heart, in the soul, in the mind, in the body of the believer that produces that life. And if that light is existing in us, what can we do but shine forth the light of the gospel truth? That's one of the reasons why whenever Jesus talks about salvation, he always references the fruit of the Spirit with it. Because nobody who is truly regenerated by the Holy Spirit will fail to produce the light of the gospel. It's a necessary consequence of what's been done. But there's no understanding in the Bible of a carnal Christian. There's no understanding of a Christian who, who says things with his mouth, but his heart has not been changed. And again, if your salvation is based upon the fact that you're sitting here this morning, then you are mistaken. Right? The, the, the witness that we see in the scriptures is that those who have been regenerated by the work of the Spirit will not fail to do the work that God has called us to. That's why in the closing verse here, we see Jesus say, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Because again, one of the Beatitudes that's so important to us is the Beatitude of meekness. Recognizing again that we are nothing outside of our Savior is central to our ability to walk in the light of the gospel. Because anybody who presumes themselves to be in the covenant knows nothing of the gospel. Right? Anyone who, who says, of course God saved me, just look at me, has totally missed the message of the Bible. Because we are dead in sin. We are allied with darkness. Our father is the devil. We have no good in us. But what has come into us by the work of the Holy Spirit is only good. You think about what Jesus says in Mark 7. Right? It's not, again, what comes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of him. And the corollary is pretty obvious, right? What has come into us? The Holy Spirit and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And if the righteousness come into us, what do we produce? Righteousness. 
If we've been grafted upon the vine, then we're going to produce the fruit of the vine. Brothers and sisters, this is a very serious subject. Because the church today is not producing fruit. We, we, we wonder why the church is so weak, why the church is dying today. Because it has no life. It has no light. It has no salt. And so it's being destroyed by the world. There's a reason why we're under the judgment of God today. Think about how many times in the Bible God uses the wicked to, to destroy his, his, his covenant people. You know, when, when, when the king of Assyria woke up one morning, he didn't say to himself, well, you know, uh, the Lord's told me to go down and invade Israel. I think I'll go be obedient to the Lord. Right? He had totally ulterior motives there. Right? But God in his providence used the king of Assyria to scatter the ten tribes. And God did so because the ten tribes had lost their taste. The ten tribes had given themselves over to darkness. They had allied themselves with Ashtaroth and with Baal and placed their faith in the idols of the age. And God took away their lampstand. Cast them away. And that's what's happening today in the church. So what's the answer for what ails us? It's not programs. Right? It's not flashy things. It's not the ways of the world. The answer for what ails us is, is, again, not rocket science. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we talk about the gospel, we're not just restricting it to the, you know, the, 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 the thing that happened at the cross. We understand that the gospel has far more impact in our lives than merely giving us a get out of hell free call. But it should affect every area of our life. It should affect our day-to-day -day decisions that we make. Again, what do we value in life? Do we value the things of the Lord or do we value the things of the world? Is our time given over to the world or is it given over to the Lord? When we're making a decision about to do this thing or that thing, who wins? Because this is what Jesus is expressing to the disciples. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Are you going to serve the Lord who has given you life, given you light, given you salt, given you the eternal promise of heaven? Or are you going to choose this present evil world which is falling away? And that's the question we have to ask ourselves every day. But we can't give an answer to that on our own. You see, God has given us the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to bear one another's burdens, to rejoice with one another, to build one another up in faith. And if we're not gathering together with the saints for prayer, if we're not gathering together with the saints for encouragement, then we are in danger of being eaten by the lion which roams the earth. Because the lion's going to pick off the prey that's easiest to find. But if we're united together in faith, if we're united together in the common mission of the gospel mission to convert the, the, the heathen and bring them into the covenant family, if, if, if that's our goal, then we will see revival in our day. You want to see America change? The change has to start here. The change has to start in our hearts. Because America is not going to be saved by wicked men. America is going to be saved by the proclamation of the truth of God. And by a church which is willing to stand on the hill and allow its light to shine into the darkness. That's the answer that we need today. And we have to be willing to testify that that's what we want. More than anything else that this world provides. Because all of it's going away. All of it means nothing in comparison to the covenant of salt that God's made with us. That we will be everlasting and everlasting. Because God has seasoned the sacrifice of His Son with this covenant. 
And we have no reason to fear this present evil world, for we know that which is to come. This life is but a whisper, but a shadow of the wind. But eternal life is eternity of the God who has made the heaven and the earth. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That's the call that God's given to us. And he has richly provided us all our needs in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for the testimony of your word. Of the way again that your word shows us again what it is you've called us to be and to do as your people. And to God as we rest and trust in Christ, uh, let us again be comforted by the good news of the gospel both this day and forevermore. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, as we close our worship today, let us stand as we sing together from our green Bible song book, uh, Bible song number 161, as we sing this portion of Psalm 75. Again, promotion from God. Let us stand and sing together. as we close our service this morning and as we prepare ourselves for this Sabbath day of rest and as we look forward again to opportunities to worship God again we uh, call out unto the Lord and give thanks for his grace and again if you have need to speak unto me or the elders again we are here to help and we are here to serve in any way that we can let us turn now to our benediction which comes to us today from Nehemiah chapter 1 verses 10 and 11 hear the word of the Lord When Sambalai the Horamite, or excuse me, that's chapter 2. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name 
And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Amen.